Having said that, I'm going to move right into our first speaker, uh, is Fred uh, Provenza, uh, Professor Emeritus from the Department of Wildland Resources here at Utah State University. Fred is originally from Colorado where he began his career working on a ranch near Salida. He worked, uh, Fred's told me that he's recently moved back to that area. Uh, <clears throat> he worked on the ranch where I was getting his BS in wildlife biology from Colorado State University. At Utah State University, he earned a master's and a uh, doctorate uh, degrees in range science. He joined the faculty of Utah State University in 1982 and is currently a professor emeritus uh, in, the, in the Department of Wildland Resources. He's been the author and co-author of 225 publications in peer-reviewed journals and books and has received numerous awards for research, teaching, and mentoring students. So, Fred? Thanks, Paul, and to the organizing committee as well. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with all of you today to talk about um, restoring the West and how behavior, in my case, connects uh, humans, animals, uh, and animals with landscape. There are some overarching points that I'd like to begin with that, that I think, for me, puts my presentation into a context and the first two have to do with the following. The first that strikes me so much, reflecting back over the years and where I'm living now in the backwoods of Colorado, the peace and serenity there, is the deep level of interconnectedness and interdependence among all things in life. Um, quantum and relativistic physics differ in their approaches and their worldviews in many respects, but the one respect upon which they absolutely agree is the undivided wholeness of everything in the universe. Um, some of the oldest ideas on the planet in traditions like Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, have to do exactly with that, that everything is interconnected and interdependent across time and space. Based on those kind of thoughts, ecology is actually a very young discipline that could learn a great deal from these other disciplines. The second point that I'd like to make is that the only constant in this interconnected universe of ours is change. The world is constantly changing, and yet we typically regard change as anomalous, a kind of a transitory disruption in a normally constant world. Even Albert Einstein was reluctant to accept change when he introduced the cosmological constant into the general theory of relativity, but that amount of two is refusing to accept change as a guiding principle structuring the evolution of the universe, and it was, as he later recounted, the greatest blunder of his career. On a more local scale, when droughts, tsunamis, hurricanes uh, occur, when great volcanoes erupt, knocking down trees, covering the earth with a layer of volcanic ash for miles around, we think how strange it is that nature should misbehave so. It is, we tell ourselves, a momentary lapse, a kind of a geological tanker. Soon our old planet will regain its composure, its sameness. But the truth is, it's only our short tenure on Earth that deludes us. Our time here is too short to see continents crash together and tear apart. Mountains rise and fall, vast deserts replace oceans. Climates warming and cooling endlessly, too short to see literally tens of thousands of plant animal species coming and going like the ever-changing colors and shapes of the kaleidoscope. Change then isn't the exception to the rule, it's the only rule. Any individual, any social group, any species, if it is to survive, has got to be able to cope with ever-changing complex adaptive systems. And there's three characteristics of these systems that I want to discuss to put my, my presentation into a context. First is that these systems self-organize at all levels. Now what's interesting to me is that our Western culture teaches us to think in linear hierarchical ways. But in fact there is no one central controlling force, only a large number of holons all interacting and adapting one to another and to their local environments. Complex patterns emerge, ever transform, and then vanish from the local interactions amongst all the parts. Complex systems also uh, exhibit nonlinear behaviors in which cause and effect aren't proportional at all, thresholds are common, behaviors are absolutely contingent, and they're unpredictable. As a result, concept, complex adaptive systems demonstrate sensitivity to current conditions. You can get one result on one day, but the identical interaction the following day is going to yield a different result. As a result, any modifications to the system we thus produce results in <coughs> produce results that we cannot necessarily anticipate or predict in advance. 
Finally, complex adaptive systems exhibit emergent behaviors that arise from the unending potential number of interactions that occur as the parts forever interact one with another across time. In that sense, then, life becomes an unending series of bifurcations in the face of varying degrees of uncertainty. Um, for instance, here, the, it says, The can of mace lay where it had fallen from Bill's hand, and for a moment time froze as each pondered the significance of this new development. Huh? That's what life is, and at all levels, from cells to ecosystems, that's what, what, what it is. And bifurcation, behavior of bifurcations, depends upon history. The history of everything from a microbe through to a human influences its behavior. Need and then chance. Chance kind of events. Chance enters in over and over again at all levels from quantum mechanics right on through to the behavior of, of living organisms and systems. As a result then, when we interact with a complex system, we, inter we initiate downstream consequences over and over and over again that emerge days, weeks, and even years later. Life is thus an unending series of unanticipated and often unintended consequences. At the turn of the last century, uh, people interviewed some of the most prominent people of the time, scientists, philosophers, politicians, and so forth, and they asked them the question, what's the Earth going to look like in a hundred years, socially, economically, ecologically? It's a riot to read their, what, what people thought would happen because they're so far wrong in everything they ever anticipated would be. The best explanation of all, the best discussion of all was by James William Sullivan. He said, the future is a fancy land place. I find I'm unable to prophesy. The future is a fancy land place whose portals I cannot enter. Moving toward it from here, I'm charmed with its brilliant facade, what sculptured splendors, porticos, pillars, stature, windows. What is within? As I advance, however, the airy structure recedes. I cannot push beyond its thresholds. Its doors never open. On the other side are only silence and mystery. For me at this point in my life, what interests me most is the mystery and wonder of life. I don't have to know. It's the mystery and wonder that captures my, my interest. So, bottom line here, I think we don't understand complex adaptive systems except in a very general way. Whenever we think we do, the more certain we get, we learn that we don't. We simply interact with them and adjust our behavior accordingly based on whatever feedback we can gain. So, from a science standpoint, there is no absolute truth in science. All concepts and theories are absolutely limited and approximate. Science is a quest for understanding, for truth, an attempt to account for observable phenomena, but science cannot be perceived as true or final in any sense at all. It's merely a tentative organization of working hypotheses that for the moment best account for facts concerning biophysical processes whose interconnections are the, fa the fabric of a web characterized by change. So. If that's the case, then how does one manage complex, poorly understood, ever-changing, ecological, social, economic systems in light of a future not knowable or predictable in ways that won't diminish options for future generations? I think that the most important facet of that is developing philosophies that embrace change and pathways that enable us to continually adapt in ever-changing environments. I think one of the best ways to do that is to pull people with totally different backgrounds and world views, world views together to interact. That's what I want to talk about in relation to the work that we've been trying to do over the last 10 years or so. The science of the work is 35 years old now, trying to understand behavior and how it works and what it means. But the interactions of trying to, to blend the bright, best and brightest in science with the best and brightest managers to bring them together constantly to, to interact, understand and engage, to nurture innovation is what I'll talk about here today. And so I have three sections to this presentation and I'll very briefly touch on each one. I'll first talk about the science that underlies the, the section and then some of the management that's being done as a function of that, all with an emphasis on understanding behavioral principles and processes. And the facets of behavior that we've looked at have to do with how do creatures continually adapt to ever-changing environments. And there are three, three topics that I want to talk about. First is the individual and the wisdom body. 
that there's a wisdom that's built into bodies of all creatures, from microbes to humans, that knows how to behave in particular systems if we simply allow that to happen. Secondly, I want to talk about social cultural wisdom, the, the knowledge that's built into social groups about how to continually adapt and survive in particular environments. Lastly, I want to talk about this notion of satiety. Satiety encourages individuals and social groups to explore the bounds between the, uh, the known and the unknown. It's incredibly functional. So what satiety, causing animals to, to, to continually adapt in environments. So I want to begin this first topic on the wisdom body by talking about more than a matter of taste. I'm going to ask you a question. If I were to ask you why you like a particular food, what would you tell me? Don't be bashful. Odds are you tell me you like it because it tastes good, right? If I ask you why you don't like a particular food, what would you tell me? Odds are you tell me it tastes bad and you'd be in good company because that's how it's defined in the dictionary. But what I'm going to say here is that the wisdom body and the adaptability across time and space, what's so critical, the wisdom body is more than a matter of taste. It's a functional interrelationship between the flavor of a food and what happens when that food gets into the body. If you think about why any creature eats a food, where that food goes, it goes to cells. Cells and cell membranes are ultimately what's foraging. We're holons as a part of that system. And it's these so-called primary compounds, or nutrients, as you would call them, and secondary compounds, alkaloids, terpenes, oxalates, on and on and on, that the body is integrating to, in terms of nutrition and health. So it's flavor feedback interaction that's really critical, and that leads to ongoing adaptation in ever-changing environments. In other words, animals don't genetically know a particular food, they're learning about foods in that sense. So how did we come to those conclusions? Very briefly, what we do is to make animals deficient in the nutrient that we're interested in. Then we take two groups, in this case I'm going to illustrate here. On odd days, animals in this group that were made deficient in energy, they're mildly deficient in energy, are, apple, are offered apple-flavored straw for an hour-long meal. Animals in this group get maple-flavored straw for a meal. After that meal, we take the stomach tube, put it directly into their gut, Drench them with a quart of water. Now that only makes sense in really taxpayer dollars at work. Now that only makes sense in relation to what we do on even days. It's academia. We, we switch the flavors. Animals got apple, now get maple and vice versa. But after the meal, we drench them with the nutrient that they're deficient in. Now, if they're picking up, if they're associating the flavor with the post-ingestive consequences of that, animals in group one should prefer which flavor, apple or maple? Good, you're still awake in every day. Absolutely. These should prefer apple. These should, pre these should prefer maple. These should prefer apple. That's exactly what happens, and it's amazing how powerful those responses are. Here's a short video segment that simply illustrates that with two groups of sheep. One group of sheep, after they ate straw, we drenched them with the star solution over a week or so period. The other group, that group, <laughs> was drenched with water. And there's a total difference in terms of their preference for the straw simply based on this ongoing monitoring and feedback. The one group loves straw, the other group can't figure out what they're doing. So it's the body wisdom in action and it's the dynamic of that. Uh, in relation to, to energy, Dave Barry says, what are calories? He says, calories are little units that measure how good a particular food tastes. Fudge, for example, has a great many calories, whereas celery, which is not really a food at all, but a member of the plywood family, provided by Mother Nature so we have a way to get onion dipped into our mouths at parties, has none. At the feedback term, and that's exactly, exactly what the point is here to the whole deal. I'm going to make a really long story, 25 years of work, very, very short. I'm simply going to say that it doesn't matter whether you're looking at primary compounds or secondary compounds, feedback absolutely drives those responses, that relationship between flavor and feedback. What I'm going to go on to say in the presentation is it's not one thing or the other, it's this hugely higher order interactions 
amongst all of these compounds in play with one another that influences the degree to which a particular food on a particular day is actually preferred or not preferred. It's a very dynamic, context-dependent sort of thing. The more adequate the food relative to the mix, the higher the palatability, if it's deficient or excessive, the lower the palatability. That sums up 30 years of work in about 30 seconds. So anyway, implications of that, and again, I'm just very briefly going to touch on this, but there are some really important implications in terms of managing landscapes, and people are way following up on all this nowadays with our group and, and totally independent of what we've done. The first is simply that because palatability isn't something that's genetically fixed and set in stone, animals can be trained. They can learn a whole bunch of stuff. And so through using the use of conditioned food aversions, we can train animals and have done so, and people are working with it, to forage and forest plantations to eat the understory and leave the trees alone. Huge programs are going on in organic agriculture and agrico in, La in California nowadays under the title of vines and ovines. And <clears throat> they're training the animals to eat the understory. They, by their urine and feces, they fertilize and clip that, but they're trained to leave the grapes alone. I've worked for 20 years with people in Cuba in citrus groves. So animals can be trained to, to graze in targeted ways, is the point. Can also be trained to avoid poisonous plants. Horses trained to avoid plants like local wheat, cattle trained to avoid plants like larkspur. You can also train animals to eat foods. And there's some programs that are going around this country and around the world that are, are targeting grazing and turning animals into weed eaters. Uh, especially working with cattle to eat all, any of a whole variety of weeds. It's skin basically on this idea that palatability isn't set in stone, feedback matters, and you can train animals up. We've had a huge program over a 10 year period now using cattle and sheep to rejuvenate sagebrush steppe landscapes. Economically and environmentally, we see them as hugely desirable compared to some of the traditional ways of doing that. And we're doing it now to try to improve habitat for a huge range of, of different animal species, is the bottom line. Second point then in terms of ongoing adaptation to change. The first was that palatability is more than a matter of taste. There's this wisdom body. The second has to do with these transgenerational links, how culture links animals to landscapes. And to me, it's really about what it means for creatures to be locally adapted to the landscapes they inhabit. And that's everything from domestic animals to the people who manage those. In a very important way for me, it's how Offspring learn from their ancestors through their mothers to be adapted. It's the wisdom that gets into social groups of how to be in a particular environment. And certainly in science and, and often in management, we focus on anatomy and physiology and very little is talked about in terms of culture. But culture is equally important and the three are totally integrated one with another. In social uh, creatures, which so many are, it's, it's very interesting because mother becomes a critical transgenerational link. Her knowledge of what and what not to eat, where and where not to go, what's a predator, what's not a predator, becomes absolutely essential for the survival of her offspring. On the other hand, what's interesting, and I'll save the stories, Paul, <laughs> um, Offspring are often the ones that add creativity to the system. They bring the new knowledge into the group. And so you have this amazing balance then between stability and creativity that comes as a result of those interactions. So much work has been done now, and it's amazing. I've been spending a lot of time in the human literature reading that lately. And uh, it's just absolutely clear that a mother's what a mother eats has a lifelong influence on her offspring in so many ways, not only in terms of what they eat, but their health as they go through life. Starts in utero, mother's milk is also a very important transfer mechanism as is mother as a model. The same sort of things are true for habitat preferences. It's been shown most experimentally in cross-fostering studies with sheep where you take sheep from one area, uh, in adjacent areas, but cross foster sheep, uh, sheep that use different parts of an environment, wean their offspring, the offspring go where their foster mother went, where they've learned to go. We did five years worth of study on habitat preferences on the Maxfield Thompson Forest Service Summer Range allotment years ago, showing the very same things. We cross fostered animals that preferred Maxfield onto Thompson, vice versa. 
Look then for the next several years at where those animals went. Mom had a lifelong influence on habitat selection patterns of those offspring. But it's not just in, in sheep and, and cattle and so forth. It's in all kinds of creatures. These natal experiences affect food and habitat preferences in a range of taxa, from insects to fish to birds to mammals. Why is that the case? It's the home field advantage in life, not just in sports, in life. And again, that knowledge of knowing what and what not to eat, where and where not to go, what's a predator and what's not, becomes absolutely essential for survival. What's really cool about all this to me is that one can argue that the body determines the structure of experience, but it's just as true that experience is determining the structure of the body. Starting in utero, these experiences that an animal has are shaping the way the nervous system develops, so you have neurological, morphological, and physiological changes in development that are taking place as a result of these experiences early in life, and then they're moved from generation to generation. Um, and so you get behavioral changes that go in concert with those. It's chicken and egg all the way on this stuff. And this is a great book from a human standpoint of, of all that that's going on. So bottom line here, after 40 years of working in this area, it's my contention that couch potatoes do indeed actually begin to develop early in life as tater tots. Huh? It's the bottom line of what I'm talking about here. Uh -oh. There's a field that's emerging now. It's actually been in its infancy for 30 or 40 years now, but it's really starting to catch the press and, and be huge in science. And it's a field referred to as epigenetics. Epigenetics simply means above the genome. And what that's talking about is genes being expressed as a function of interactions with social and biophysical environments, and then that, that transferring from generation to generation. This, if you're not familiar with that area, this DVD here, Ghost in Your Genes, is a Nova special that's just fantastic in terms of illuminating that. It's, it has huge implications for what it means to continually adapt to ever-changing environments, and it does it for everything from microbes to plants to, to, to any kind of creature that, that's alive. Two very quick examples. Supplemental phytochemicals like genistin influence incidence of obesity, diabetes, Coat color, in this case here, these two mice are absolutely identical genetically. This one's mother, when this was in the womb, ate a diet that had this secondary compound in it that caused certain genes to be expressed that influenced coat color. This animal obviously is not obese, has low incidence of diabetes, and that's passed from generation to generation. That's epigenetics in action, the way it works. Also, in terms of stress and levels of stress, there's some wonderful work that's being done that shows that the amount of nurturing that a young animal has early in life influences gene expression, influences how calm that individual is as an adult, which passes then from generation to generation. So the points I'm trying to make are simply that nurturing in the animal world and these interactions among creatures are hugely important no matter what the creature you're talking about, whether it's tigers in India, lions in Africa, zebras, elephants, baboons, polar bears, creatures in the ocean, on a riverbank, and humans as well, huh? <laughs> there's a lot to think about from a human society standpoint. I mean this to be funny, but there's an awful lot to think about in terms of what's happening to the structures of our societies as relates to all that I'm talking about, actually. So three points very briefly here as relates to this topic in terms of implications, culture, economy, economics, snapshots of time past, and culture and conservation. The first one, I'm going to begin with the story, and it has to do with movements that you may or may not be aware of that are taking place within the livestock industry at the grassroots level. And they're about how to become locally adapted to landscapes. That's really what it's about. And if you, how to get out of fossil fuel loops, how to cut costs, how to become adapted. And I'm going to start with a story, and the story is from a book titled The Last Ranch. It was written by Sam Bingham. And in that book, Sam is interviewing an old, old rancher. His name's George Witten, and George is talking about the way that things used to be back in the day. And he's saying, you know, back in 1935, we selected for 75-pound lambs we culled ewes with twins. Now in 1985, which is several years back now, he's saying, you're selecting for much larger lambs and a much bigger lamb crop. But he's pointing out that they're not so well adapted. You're having to do that with fossil fuel inputs, with huge inputs. He said, 
Our ewes were as strong and as well muscled as deers. Yours wouldn't last the day where ours went. And where they went, what they did was to winter. This was on the San Luis Valley. They'd winter on the floor of the San Luis Valley uh, on forages that were available there, not on, on hay that's so expensive to produce. Then they'd make these huge cycles just as wildlife would migrate up to the higher elevations as it got into, into summer and the fall and then back to these, these areas. So they had this cycle that was very much adapted to the local landscape and very much low input. Now I said that some people back in those days got interested in trying to recreate the old sheep cycle. And this is a really important point here. He said, they were crazy. So once that knowledge is gone, you can't get it back just like that. They didn't even have a dog that knew anything. He said, when they went through here, you knew they were looking for trouble and they found it. The point is that all this kind of knowledge is learned and is passed from generation to generation. And when you break those transgenerational links, it's gone. And so from the dog to the sheep to the people, they didn't know what they were doing. You have to relearn that knowledge. Now there's whole groups of people, if any of you know of Kit Farrow and the 20,000 people that are on his listserv, that's an example of that in action of people trying to relearn these old behaviors. And what is it, and helping one another to do it. And what is it that they're, they're trying to do here? Um, they're trying to get out of fossil fuel links, basically, because that's what's enabled animals to survive on landscapes that they're really not adapted to be. What are they doing from a management standpoint then? Matching production cycles to seasonal availability of forage. They look at when are wildlife having their babies, that's the time to do it. That alone can save upwards of $100 per animal per year. Simply that, it's hard to do. It's easy to talk about. It takes a lot to change when you, when you animals have their, have their offspring. But it's hugely adaptive. Retaining animals that can survive on what nature provides in, in the landscape seasonally. That means year-round. Selecting If the animals can't make it on what's available, get rid of them. Call as natural selection would. Rearing offspring with their mothers where they'll be expected to, to produce as adults for all the reasons that I'm talking about. Learned in epigenetic. Um, selecting for locally adapted families based on learning uh, epigenetic and learned abilities of matrilines to use diets and habitats. These are all the things that these people are doing. And to me it makes sense and to them as well, ecologically and economically, it also makes beha sense behaviorally. Behavior links ecology and economics by providing a match between what's on offer and animals adapted to use that. Second point that I want to make of implications has to do with snapshots of times past. And if there's anything I think you can get everybody to agree on, it's, a, it's this topic of invasive species, and we all agree that they don't belong here. But I want you to step back and think with me for just a second here. There's over 50,000 species of invasive plants in the United States and the numbers on the rise. We spend $120 billion every year trying to get rid of them or to deal with them. Yet this review that I'm referring to here out of Cornell says, you know, sadly, we have very few results. In fact, if you look at what happens from a plant standpoint and an herbicide standpoint, what we've done is actually to select for herbicide resistant species, we've got the most on the planet here in the U.S. It's Darwin 101, how it's antibiotic resistance, antihilobetic resistance, plant resistance, animals, plants are continually adapting to changes that they encounter in their environment. This book here I think is fascinating. It's written by a plant biologist named E.C. Pelou. And what she does is she's talking about what's happened since the Ice Age, and she's talking about the tremendous movements of plant and animal species around North America. And what one starts to appreciate, I think, and the point I'm trying to make, is that plant species are forever moving around the globe. And I'm not saying we should encourage invasives, but I'm simply saying, you look over any time frame, they're moving around all the time. So to me, I've said forever, well, what is native then? made the point things never were the way they were and they never will be again. Yet how many careers and lifetimes have been spent trying to go back to the way things were? My whole education from CSU through to here was about pristine areas and the way that things used to be. And we go on to interpret snapshots of times past as the way things always were and always should be without appreciating that what we're photographing actually are moving targets. I think in our attempts to recreate the past, which is history and mostly mystery, 
And to predict the future, which is mystery and soon to be history, we miss the mystery and wonder of the moment, which is all that we ever are ever really going to have. I like to tease my colleagues over the years and ask them, if we'd been here when species we consider to be now native were invading, what would we have done? They'd get a big smile on their face because they know we just tried to get rid of them, which is what we're doing right now. Rather than thinking about that yesterday invasives are today's new natives and tomorrow's relics. From an herbivore and plant standpoint, I think what we need to do is learn to love them to death. Utilize them, adapt to them, and to start to utilize them. That's why I think what Kathy Both's doing with turning cows into weed eaters is really positive. Utilize them. Uh, what ranchers that we've worked with, with like Ray Bannister, who've retrained their entire cattle herds to mix the best with the rest, rather than eat the best and leave the rest, uh, I think there's a lot of merit to that. Last point I want to make on this section has to do with conservation and management. And I think this idea of epigenetics and, and ongoing adaptation to change is so, so important as people think about these areas. And I want to step back and make a comment here at first that relates not only to this, what I'm going to say now, but to the rest of my presentation. And um, what strikes me more and more as I've read over the last 10 years, books after books and watched documentaries, is this triangle that has to do with political, corporate, and academic systems, originally intended to serve humanity, I think are now so heavily invested in control for power and profit that people are merely a means to an end, control the masses and make profits. Trickle-down economic theory is responsible for billion-dollar corporations, millionaire CEOs, growing populace of the poor and getting poor who are also poorly fed, clothed, and housed. Government officials and university employees are bought and sold, so pilot society pays the cost. And if you're not familiar with this area, there's so many books and DVDs like The Corporation and University Inc. that are out there. And it, it, it relates to all facets, from fruit and dug to agriculture to the big environmental kinds of groups. It's highlighted from an environmental standpoint in this book here, In a Dark Wood, The Fight Over Forests and the Myths of Nature. Um, from an academic standpoint, people who've never even seen an owl were writing theoretical papers on owls and on what size habitats ought to be, home ranges should be for owls. Come to find out, as we often do 10 to 20 to 30 years later, when everybody starts to have an assessment of these things, and they say, oh no, that wasn't the way it was. In fact, which owls need old growth forests? The argument was, you know, that owls, spotted owls have to have old growth forests. We come to find out only owls that are born and raised in old growth forests actually have to have old growth forests. In fact, owls can live at the edge between old and new growth forests quite nicely and in new growth forests as well. And in fact, their home ranges are much smaller. Why? Because the availability of forage resources is much greater. So the general point, more general point I'm trying to make is that what's the average lifetime of a species? Several hundred thousand to a few million years. Think of the tremendous, tremendous changes that occur during that time period. Creatures aren't machines, genes aren't destiny, animals continually adapt to ever-changing environments. That sort of viewpoint has allowed us then, from a very practical standpoint, to markedly to eliminate bear depredation in forests in the northwest by strategically supplementing bears when they come out of hibernation for a very short period with what they, when they come out, they'll, they'll strip these trees, they'll bark trees, an individual bear can bark from 200 to 300 trees in the night. Now if you assume that they don't just hate warehouser, the question is why do they do that? They're doing that to get the energy that's in these being translocated. We've developed a strategic supplement for a couple week period, totally eliminates bear depredation. Same view has allowed us to change the culture of a thousand head of elk that, that were being fed all winter long over at Deseret through a combination of strategies, strategic grazing by cattle to provide forage resource for the elk during winter, uh, strategic supplementation of, of supplements that, that enable them to utilize plants on the winter range, low stress techniques for moving animals, and strategic hunting so that animals learn their safe places and not safe places. We changed the culture of that thousand head of animals over the last six year period. 
That same sort of viewpoint has allowed Bob Budd to retrain a group of cattle when he was managing Red Canyon Ranch for Nature Conservancy. Cattle lived in these bottoms. Bob wanted to show that you could blend ranching and conservation the way that they did it rather than fence these areas at huge cost to the environment and economically. Hired a rider, Travis Clyde. Every day his job was to move those animals up into the uplands and settled them in over a three year period. They retrained that cattle herd and Travis worked his way out of a job because at the end of three years it was the mothers that were training the offspring. The culture of the herd had been changed. Bottom line here, we stress genetics as a mechanism of evolution. If you're in an animal science program, you take genetics classes. If you're in ecology and evolution, you take genetics classes. And so, as the old saying goes, if your only tool's a hammer, everything's a nail. And so we see animals behaving in certain ways. This one says, earthquakes are coming. Yep, the mysterious innate intuitions of some animals. What I'm trying to say here is that learning and epigenetics are so critically important to ongoing adaptation within and across the lifetimes of, that, of, of animals. It's not this slow, long mutation and selection over eons. It's happening day to day, week to week as animals go. The last point that I want to make, and then I'll conclude with, with comments that relate to the first, has to do with the importance of satiety and variety. It's about how satiety links biodiversity with soil, plants, herbivores, and people. And it goes back to the first ideas of, of these primary and secondary compounds in the interaction one with another, influencing liking as a function of need, but the idea here is that these things cause animals to satiate. In bottom line is that it causes animals to want to eat a variety of foods and forage in a variety of places. They, like we, get sick and tired of eating the same old things and being in the same old places. And the key point here is that there is nothing, I don't think, that's more important for nutrition and health than eating a huge array of foods and going to different places. It's absolutely vital in nutrition and health of all creatures including humans, as I'll get to here. Biodiverse diets enhance nutrition and health, and from a, an, an economic standpoint, they reduce costs. We've worked with cattle, uh, sheep, bison, in confinement, on pastures, on rangelands, and over and over again, choice and ability to choose increases uh, performance, reduces illness, and it, it increase, increases profitability. Choice also creates opportunities for complementarities, one of the things I think is so interesting. I just finished co-editing co a book with, with, uh, with a friend in, in France, Michel Muret is his name, and one of the most amazing things that they do in France is to herd their sheep, cattle, and goats in these Alps and Pre-Alps in what they refer to as grazing circuits. And it's totally devised to try to maximize appetite, to keep the animals to continually interested in eating a variety of foods. So rather than look at a landscape, and it's landscape ecology applied, and say, you know, well, this is the very best place, so we're going to just beat the hell out of this. They're looking at the whole landscape and thinking about how can we move the animals across that landscape from meal to meal within the day and then across days so that they'll utilize everything that's out there and in the process continually keep their appetite stimulated. If you think about that, what that does is to present, prevent overuse of certain areas and underuse of others so that you get more uniform use and enhanced ability to maintain biodiversity rather than eat the best and leave the rest. They're mixing all of those things together. So these grazing circuits then are designed to stimulate appetite and intake. They enable individuality. Every individual is so different one from another when you start studying individuals and what they do from an herbivore standpoint. Choice and ability to choose enables individuality. Um, and that also enables then this, this kind of use then to maintain the biodiversity of landscapes. So there'll be a target area, for instance, that they want to graze, and maybe from the resting place they'll come out to an appetizer, appetizer stimulator phase, and they'll go to the target area, then to a booster phase, then back. That has huge implications for people nowadays that are way into managing grazing of domestic livestock, and moving them uh, several times within the day. Oftentimes people in this country use polywire fence to do that, but if you're shepherding animals across landscapes and 
interested in targeting weed species, it's hugely, hugely opportunistic to use this. Um, for instance, one very quick example here. This is spotted knapweed up in, in Montana, and the lady that was doing the herding there told me, you know, if you come out in the morning and you try to force them to eat knapweed, they won't do it. If you start out with an appetizer phase of other kinds of plants and then go to the knapweed, they eat it like crazy. It's French herding practices in action, and it has to do with complementarities and sequences in which foods are eaten. I won't tell the story here, but bitterbrush and sagebrush have those same kind of complementarities going on them with, with them. The tannins in, in bitterbrush uh, help the terpenes and sagebrush to go down, basically. So there's these complementarities among species that get very important in terms of animal use and then the dynamics of plant communities on landscapes. We're doing a lot of work with pasture plants now. Endified infected tall fescue produces more animals than any other plant in this, in this country. It's very high in alkaloids. We're learning that if you, if you have plants that are high in saponins or high in tannins, they complement the alkaloids. And in fact, sequence makes a difference. It's better to have animals eat, eat a meal of alfalfa first and then fescue or trefoil first in terms of their ability to utilize those plants. I want to end this section by talking about the links among soil, plant, animal, and people. And soil is the bottom line on this. Without soil, healthy soil, nothing in a system survives. And these secondary compounds, as it turns out, are so influential in terms of what's happening to scale throughout those systems, these phytochemicals. If you review the literature in the ecological area, literature of the last 30 to 40 years, you'll find that, that what's emphasized there is these secondary compounds are defenses against herbivory. And that's been shown in everything from marine systems with mammals to in terrestrial systems with or marine systems with fishes to terrestrial systems with insects, birds, and mammals. And uh, the secondary compounds have taken on a kind of a negative connotation. They serve as defenses that limit intake. If you look in the agronomic literature, they're viewed as toxins. Now, what's interesting, so they, this, the point I'm trying to make is there's this negative connotation. Now, if you look at people who study plants, what they've come to realize is these aren't secondary compounds at all. They're absolutely vital in the health and functioning of plants. They serve a tremendous, tremendous number of roles. Everything from sunscreen to drought resistance to hormonal signaling, recovery from injury, on and on and on and on. They're, they're absolutely vital for the health and the nutrition of plants. Now, here's the irony that I want to get at here. You know, what we've done in agronomy is to select plants that we think can really pr be productive in terms of crops or gardens or pastures. And the first thing we do is to identify what's the secondary compounds in that, and we reduce their concentrations because those compounds are limiting intake of any one particular food. If you want people and other animals to eat a large amount of them, you've got to get rid of them. But at the same time then, so we're, we're reducing their concentration to maximize yields of crops and pastures, but they're inevitably more susceptible to environmental hardships. As a result then, we've come to rely on fertilizers, herbicides, and insecticides to grow and protect plants in monocultures, come to rely on antibiotics and antilemetics to maintain the health of livestock. From a people standpoint, we've replaced whole foods rich in phytochemicals with nutrition supplements and pharmaceuticals. Now that whole change in production systems has huge costs that we're just starting to incur in society. You know, in 1940, it took one calorie of fossil fuel food energy to produce 2.3 calories of food. Nowadays, it takes 10 calories to produce a single calorie of modern food, food, supermarket food. The bottom diet is abysmal that American people eat, and we all know it. Levels of obesity and uh, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, they're totally linked to diet, are, are causing health care, and we've just seen the tip of the iceberg on this, to spiral. 5% in 1960, 16% of the national income in 2009. Diet related, uh, all diet related kinds of issues. So, you know, some people are aware of this, and, and so they're trying to say, well, we need to change what we eat. People need to change their diets. 
but neither adults are complying despite the fact that people are, are, are arguing to the contrary. And there's a couple of reasons I want to point out here. The first goes back to what I was talking about earlier, and there's just getting to be a wealth of information that what young people learn to eat starts as a function of what mom's eating. In utero, the flavors of foods that mom's eating get in the amniotic fluid, they get in her milk when she's nursing, and then mother is a model. So you get into these vicious cycles of, 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 uh, that are linked transgenerationally. Um, all of this is being discussed in books that I think are fantastic now. Todd's book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, is an amazing review of the scientific literature in, as it relates to calories. And basically, his bottom line is that if we want to be healthy, we've got to get rid of all of the, all of the, all of the um, highly processed foods from our diet. Colin Campbell, this, this fantastic book on the China study, is arguing that, that animal-based foods cause are, are an important cause of all of these things. If you want the Reader's Digest version, Michael Pollan's book is fantastic. Bottom line, eat food. If your great-grandmother wouldn't recognize it as food, don't eat it. Not too much. Calorie restriction actually may, uh, adds to longevity of life in a huge array of species. And the <clears throat> last point he makes is mostly plants. So, Again, in this, when you read these books, you realize this corporate, political, academic triangle is just rampant in all these in terms of keeping this system in place above and beyond the, the social transgenerational part. So, these are unintended consequences, huh? Although, I don't think, it's not so unintended in some place, unanticipated unintended. What I'm trying to make is that natural landscapes that are biodiverse, and you should encourage that, are nutrition centers and pharmaceuticals, loaded with rich arrays of these compounds that we know are so vital in the health of us and everything in the system, plants and plant-based food. From an animal standpoint, people have written about some of this, and it's a huge, there's a huge area on this idea of, of how animals keep themselves well. Cindy Engel's book, uh, Wild health animals to keep themselves well and what we can learn from them. Has to do with how animals do that and how they maintain health on after a hard night. These are some chapters in the book, so I'm just going to cruise now. Our goal then, and, and then I do have some concluding remarks I want to hit. Take me a couple of minutes, Paul, don't shoot me. <laughs> what we're interested in in this program is how you create healthy landscapes from the ground up, not pills and procedures that treat symptoms of health health. And it starts at the soil, as Andrea Doisan argued over 50 years ago. Our health, health look to the health of soil. Resource availability, the, the soil that's, that that's on influences what grows there, the diversity of plants and their chemistry, which influences the health and nutrition of herbivores. And livestock grazing can hugely build up soil and plant communities. That's the bottom line. What animals eat, what they eat, diverse diets, the, the quality of meat and milk and their animal products are hugely different, their characteristics. If animals are eating a biodiverse diet versus a very limited diet in terms of products for us. Herbivore grazing can also be a huge tool in terms of, of helping to, to fix carbon from the atmosphere. My good friend uh, Christine Jones from Australia has made the point for Australia, has made the point more generally that for every ton of humus that's fixed in the soil by livestock, you fix 3.67 tons of, of carbon from the atmosphere. For Australia, if they, if they um, fix a half a percent of carbon on 2% of the landscapes, Australia's carbon neutral. So what I'm trying to say here, and I'm, I'm summing up now, Paul, is simply the following. What I'm trying to do is to talk about linkages from cells to landscapes. And Arthur Kostler coined the, the term holon for these interrelationships involving parts and wholes. And he stressed that each holon has two conflicting properties, an integrated pro propensity to function as part of the larger whole and a self-assertive propensity to safeguard its individual autonomy. Within a body or social system, each cell or individual must affirm its individuality to maintain the functioning of the system, but it must also yield to the demands of the whole to make the system viable. These two tendencies are opposite but complementary. In a healthy system, be that a cell, an individual, a society, or an ecosystem, there's a balance between integration and self-assertion that is not static, 
but consists by necessity of the dynamic interplay between these two complementary tendencies which makes the whole system flexible and open to constant change and creativity. Uh, on the one hand, fossil fuels then have provided many benefits for people during the past century, but they've also made people independent one from another to the extent that's created a huge imbalance between, between assertion and integration. This documentary here, The Power of Community, is about what happened in Cuba when the Soviet Union collapsed and about how people had to start to work together. They were forced to work together in the power of the, cre of the community to create. It's an amazing thing. And it lets you realize that endless creativity in the physical universe is real, but it comes at a price. The cost of admission is endless transformation. And the most interesting aspect of all that to me is that life lives literally by consuming itself. From stars and galaxies, creatures on Earth, uh, the notion is that from death comes life and endless transformation. Life then is an ever-burning fire. The challenge is to embrace the world as it moves and changes, to feed the fire. So how does one manage these landscapes, given that sort of thing in mind? The challenge is to transcend the boundaries that we create. That we create. Come to see life as a stage upon which the challenge to learn to love one another plays out, no matter one's vocation. The courage to love is the courage to transcend tradition, and it's the source of creativity. And as paradoxical as it may seem, creativity comes from the unions of pairs of opposites, from ceaselessly dying to oneself, only to be born anew. This notion of love your enemies is not trivial in that sense. Love your enemies. By opening up to other peoples, we vastly increase the diversity of options upon which to act. Love, then, is the source of creativity. When people lose the capacity to love one another, they lose hope. When they lose hope, they lose the ability to imagine a future, and in so doing, they lose faith in their power to participate in creating it. In the end, then, there are but three things that matter, and the greatest of these is love. And so the best way, I think, to manage for the good of the resources is to integrate the, the, the values and worldviews of the person you hate the most. And Joseph Campbell said it all when he summed it up. He says, We have not even to risk the adventure alone, for the heroes of all time have gone before us. The labyrinth is thoroughly known. Where we had thought to follow the thread of the hero path, we have only to follow the thread of the hero path. And where we had thought to find an abomination, we shall find a god. Where we had thought to slay another, we shall slay ourselves. Where we had thought to travel outward, we will come to the center of our own existence. Where we had thought to be alone, we will be with all the world. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you. I know I've gone a bit long, but hopefully there's time for a question with you. Or not. Okay, thanks. We have time for one or two questions, but we've got to keep moving along. Uh, so, anything comes to mind right off. Right here. So you, you, I, I, I like your idea about embracing this change, but shouldn't there be some um, consideration of the rate at which change occurs and whether or not that should be considered as being good or bad and how we should embrace that? Yes. Comment is that uh, she likes the ideas related to change, but shouldn't we consider rate? And certainly rate is important. Huh? And rate, rate, if you get going too quickly, it makes it harder for animals to adapt. Huh? Yeah, so I agree. But the bigger issue is that thinking about how to embrace that, huh? how to embrace change, and then how to work with rate as well. Right. I uh, you mentioned a little bit about training some wildlife uh, developed up in, in Desiree, etc. A lot of the problems that we run into is trying to, for example, keep elk out of Aspen, which is more of a short-term mission. We go and we treat the ass and we want to keep the cattle out or the, the elk out for a short term. Can you see a way that we can train the animals sort of in the short term uh, like that? Way good question and point. What Frank's saying is, you know, we, we did the work at Deseret to, to train change the culture of that herd over there. But on issues related to aspen and overuse of aspen by elk livestock as well, huh? Are there ways that, that we can, can train those animals? That question has been asked and raised so many times uh, without people actually starting to look from a behavioral standpoint. I'm working with a group in Colorado now, and if you would be interested to hook up 
I think that's a, that's a huge issue that there would be great possibility. We're starting to brainstorm. We're going to start working. It's one of these hedge fund managers that's fabulously wealthy. We're going to start doing that over on this place in Blue Valley to start to work. And I, I'm serious when I say that. I think there's that's such a hugely interesting, intriguing area with tons of possibilities if we start to think creatively about how we could do that. So let's follow up on that. Okay, we're going to have to cut it off there, so we're out of time. Okay, well, you bet. Please uh, try to uh, get a hold of Fred in the hallway there, ask a question at a break. Uh, we really want to encourage that interactive discussion. So.